Welcome back to The Breakfast. And of course, we're moving into our next major conversation this morning, and it's the State of the Nation Address by Pastor Tunde Bakari. It has created conversations across Nigeria for those who, of course, agree with his perspectives and those who don't. This morning, we're joined by Adeyemi Saka, who, of course, will be sharing his thoughts with us. Good morning. Thanks for joining us, sir. Good morning. All right. Um, every now and then, you know, people always question the role of religious leaders um, in nation building, you know, and how, you know, they, they expect that they would be able to speak up, you know, at, at times like this. Um, so for you, when Tunibakari put out a statement, you know, was it, you know, uh, you know, as always, was it you know, something that you expected from him? And or do you also think, you know, along with those people who feel that, you um, um, you know, religious leaders should stay completely out of politics. But Mr. D. and Mr. Ka, I want you to hold your thoughts. Let's, you know, give our viewers a, a sense of what we're talking about here. And we have a video for you, you know, of, you know, Tunde Bakare expressing his thoughts on the state of the nation. We have heard from the Emma of Daura, Alaji Farouk, Uma Farouk, who lamented that what Nigeria ex is experiencing now is worse than civil war. We have heard from the Sultan of Sokoto, Alaji Muhammad Hussain Abu Bakr III, CFR, who declared that the North is, in his words, the worst place to be in this country because bandits go around in the villages, households, and markets with their AK-47 and nobody is challenging them. We have also heard from the Oni of Ife, Obadeyeye Eni Togusi, who's speaking on behalf of other Yoruba traditional rulers, including the Alafian of Oyo, Obalamidi Adeyemi, and the Awujale, Obasikiru Kaade Adetono, cried out to the president over the state of insecurity in the Southwest. The lamentations of the royal fathers have been echoed by social cultural groups across the country, including Ohaneze Indigo, the Arewa Consultative Forum, and Afeniferi. The Northern Elders Forum has gone as far as calling for the resignation of the president. Even governors and lawmakers have joined the lamentations. From one declaration to another, and from one resolution to another, the consensus among the stakeholders is that Nigeria is in a state of emergency. Welcome back uh, to The Breakfast. And of course, our conversation uh, analyzing uh, Pastor Tunde Bakari's uh, speech, a State of the Nation Address. Uh, Deyemi Saka, once again, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. It's nice to be here. All right. So let's get, in, let's get, first of all, as brief as possible, your view on religious leaders getting involved in political discussions. Well, uh, before we call it politics, I, when I, was, I have some friends of mine and my humble self, we used to like crack the joke that politics started from church. So I don't think it's out of place for religious leaders to have an opinion on issues of um, national importance, which obviously it's, it's politics. Like um, we've seen in the Bible, Samuel uh, going to Saul, telling him God wants you at a point telling him God doesn't want you. So for me, it's nothing wrong. So if it's done in, um, in clear fit, um, clear sense of judgment uh, with all sincerity and not you double speaking or playing to the gallery. Talking about double speaking, I'm going to bring in two scenarios. I remember when um, Pastor Godwin Obasiki, is it Obasiki, the other pastor, the opposition pastor yeah, in the state, Pastor Ize Yamu, thank you, yeah, yeah. Want, want, wanted to contest for uh, governorship in Edo State. I remember an interview where he categorically said that God had told him that he was going to be governor of Edo State. Also, concerning this particular situation, we've seen, we've seen lots of people come out to say God told them they're going to be president. We've seen Pastor Tunde Bakari also in this address say that um, God showed him in a vision that Buhari was the solution to Nigeria. God revealed to him that Buhari is going to stabilize Nigeria. But at the end of the day, it seems like what we see as reality is different from the visions that they seem to have told us. So really, we, these pastors seem to leave us in a confused state as to what they say their religious entity had revealed to them versus the reality. Well, I thank God you said pastors, not God, because uh, my knowledge of God and about God says God is not an author of confusion. And even um, 
God gives us the free will. He won't force you to do things. He might tell you to do things, but probably won't force you to do things. But I don't think God, in his wisdom that could, and in his creativity, and ingenuity that created the world, and everything that the universe and we're celebrating now, could believe why Muhammad Bari, which is God's incompetence, would be the one that will stabilize Nigeria. I don't think God is that unintelligent. So, probably those telling you that God revealed why we stabilize Nigeria to them should probably tell us which God. Because God is God, God would not lie. It's in the Bible that God is not the son of man that will lie. So why would God tell you why we stabilize Nigeria and what we've since 2015 to date is serious instability? So we should probably question the God speaking to them. I, for me, I, there are some things we don't need to drag God into. Um, God has given us the discerning spirit and mind to know what is right and what is wrong. Um, Nigerians chose in 2015, either rightly or wrongly, Muhammad Buhari. And in 2019, to some of us who believe they reinforced failure. So we laid our bears with tongues, we should bleed in it. All right, I, I want to read from, you know, uh, to Pastor Tunde Bakare. It says here, for many years, Nigeria was in the intensive care unit of the universe. However, six years ago, against timely warnings not to overlook fundamental and underlying conditions as the country prepared for the 2015 elections, her caregivers certified her fit and discharged her. What do you think he, you know, meant in that statement? It's just, uh, it's just on the back of it, like any, like an average Nigerian defending their choice of Mama Dubai, talking tough, if I can use that word trying to justify the need. I campaigned for Muhammad Dubai from 2007, 2011, 2015. I was a member of a stand with Bari 2016 that the presidency denounced the group. But if I could, if I, as an individual, I could get critical of Muhammad Dubai, irrespective of my political leanings, ideologies, and affiliations, and I, don't, I think it's unable for anybody just to accept the fact that they, it was a judgmental when 2015 elected Muhammad Dubai. We shouldn't drag God into this mess. We brought this mess upon ourselves. So, it's, it's, uh, Nigeria was intensive care in 2015 and was discharged, whatever, but we are probably back in ICU now in coma. We're not so sure if we're going to come out of it or we're going to slip to the other side. Yes, when, okay, let's assume, let's agree when we're in ICU in a critical condition, we, we were discharged, you know, against, you know, medical. Um, presumptions and we survived it. So what can we say has been happening since um, 2015? We're back in ICU, we're back on life support machine and probably we, we're the only, we are, we can, I can even say, if you can use the medical term, we are brain dead. Once they unplug the machine, we're gone. So that's the state we have right now. Okay. So we're even worse off than we were before 2015. He mentioned as well that he had committed himself to the Buhari administration and his campaign, you know, you know, thinking that a government of himself and Buhari would, you know, re-engineer Nigeria's politics, Nigeria's, you know, economy, uh, social structure, uh, you know, would guarantee security and, pro and prosperity of the nation. He said, but right now that Buhari's legacy is in grave danger. Does Buhari even have any legacy? Let's ask ourselves this question. There is a man Maybe until he got back into power in 2015. This is a man, even out of power for so long, or as well as an elder statesman, has not given Nigeria a composition like, you know, the composition thing we write in second primary school, letter or anything to his credit. Which legacy are we talking about here? So, I mean, a legacy as, as a two-time um, head of state, he was head of state in, in 83, and then, of course, uh, 2015. Isn't that a, a legacy? I would, um, I smiled because um, to be, some of us had stories, we grew up with stories and what have you. But if you want to know how disastrous Mama Dubari's administration has been and how predictable the failure people envisage, I would advise you to go read the cool speech of uh, Major Dongoya, Major General Dongoya, Brigida, it was then it was a Brigida Dongoya in 1985. Just take away the uh, Supreme Military Council, take away some other things. It's, it's so in sync with what is happening right now. So people say thunder doesn't strike twice. 
on the same spot, but Thunderstruck tries in Nigeria. So I don't see any legacy. Well, we, yeah, legacy because it's just with you no know, bad, bad governance, clannishness, nepotism, division uh, across the country, um, policies um, not in tune with the economic reality on the ground. That, and that's the same thing we're battling with. If you, if you, if you knew um, from what you're saying about what the 80s were like, um, you just said also that you supported the government in 2015. Yeah. So were you on the same page with Pastor Tunde Bakari back then in 2015? And do you agree that Nigeria was an intensive care unit and uh, the Good Luck Bella Jonathan administration was leading Nigeria into... Um, uh, I, my only um, issue with um, former President Good Luck Jonathan, yeah, I've, I've, I've only turned out a public apology uh, to him, was not because I didn't like his face, but there was, at the point he needed to be presidential, wasn't presidential. And to some of us, we, we wanted somebody that was going to be in charge of the command and control structure of the armed forces. That was sat himself as a commander in chief. That's why some of us felt, okay, with the credentials as a general, you can lead the troop. Even your presence will probably show direction. But we just realized that, in fact, now we, some of us are now questioning his credentials as a general. So, a, a lot of people made the mistake in 2015. My, I was one. The law of Nigerians did. And we can't be forgiven. Um, general Basanjo did as well. A lot of the old guys generally supported them. So, it, we committed the judgment in 2015. But some of us did not want to reinforce it in 2019. But Nigerians did. Okay, How so. about uh, Bakari's calls for restructuring? We've had, had this too many times. He <laughs> repeated this on Sunday. He, <laughs> APC campaigned with some major issues of restructuring, state police, and what have you. And six years gone into their, into their presidency, administration, or government, and we're still just paying lip service to this. The question is raised integrity. And a man touted to be a man of integrity, gave some pronouncements, was part of it, and has not done anything to support it. You start questioning their, their integrity, they don't have it. And EPC will not give you <laughs> restructuring. And you know, there's this, there's this sentiment that some people just believe restructuring is um, balkanization of Nigeria. Some people believe restructuring, and I think it, I, I, could, I can be speculative here. I think Mamadou Barra as a president thinks restructuring is anti not northern Nigeria, which is not. Um, at some point, I was against restructuring, but it's as going to say that we must just accept the fact that we need to restructure. In fact, uh, uh, in Nigeria, I don't know, it's criminal for anybody to be against restructuring because in the northern part of the country, they're still stuck with the criminal penal code. We still find some provisions or probably some sections there that still impose a fine of 30 naira, 80 naira. And in southern Nigeria, we're using the Criminal Justice Act. So somehow, somehow we've restructured Nigeria. Even the last protest, the NSAS protest, it was even, we had a restructured um, demonstration because why the southern people in southern Nigeria were complaining about SARS brutality, police brutality. The northerners were saying SARS is not their problem, they're serving them. So, We've, we've had, we have solid grounds and, you know, I think it's, it's now time for us to restructure, let each region grow at its own space, um, pace rather. You issue of um, the resources, of the gold in Zanfara, that was, a, that, was a, that was a talking point, gold in Zanfara, oil in South South, you know, the misinformation that was pushed out that the Zanfara was controlling its gold. You know, these are things that probably gave people concerns and probably think we should have, we should restructure Nigeria. So, moving forward, I, I think um, it's now time for, Ni for Nigerians to apparently demand their destinies to be in their hands. However, how, why? I think during the next dispensation, if you want to vote in your members to the National Assembly, you should demand these are the things you want from them. And if they can trick the constitution, because they, even once we structure, it's not we can't come through an executive fiat, a presidential fiat. They have to go through the national assembly. All right. Um, I want to. I want to um, speak. Of, still, you know, from his speech, it says here, yeah, "I am compelled to speak out because the state of the nation does not represent the Buhari I knew when we took that solemn journey towards rebuilding Nigeria." And it was referring to 2011 when he initially ran yeah, alongside President Muhammadu Buhari. 
Um, but there's a lot of people, and including in 2019 general elections, who believe that he still was the right candidate, he was leading Nigeria in the right direction. And, um, you know, currently there's a protest in the UK, pro Buhari protests going on in the UK, um, countering, of course, the anti Buhari protest, um, you know, which started a couple of days ago. Um, but there's a question that I always ask. Um, so, so two things. First of all, th so those millions of people who feel or who believe that the, the country is moving in the right direction, why do you think, you know, that they, of course, have that uh, perspective? And then second, from your analysis, do you think that the current administration was overwhelmed when they came into power or underprepared? No, they were not overwhelmed. They were not underprepared. They were not prepared at all. And not just the one said was just the quest for power. They're just getting there. So <laughs> that is it. Um, when you talk about <laughs> majority of Nigerians, um, in every society and in any society, the population of those that are wise is, is um, negligible compared to those that are otherwise, if I can use my word, I, I, I want to use a broadcast friendly language. So, otherwise, the, the population of those otherwise um, would definitely overwhelm those that are wise. And once you can appeal to the sentiments of those that are otherwise, you, you get into office. <laughs> okay. I get, you get the logic. Uh, well, I, well. <laughs> Well, it's, not, it's not, not just me now, you know, there's other people, of course, who, who would like to understand. You know, Pastor Tunde Bakar has also been... Um, no, Pastor, they've, they've, I, 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 Pastor Tunde Bakar is just trying to, I panic if I can save his face, if I can use that word, because um, you, you, nobody can tell me you didn't see this in 2017, you didn't see this in 2018, you didn't see this in 2019. There's nothing Tunde Bakar is saying now that probably an average public affairs analyst or commentator or even Nigerian, even by the new principal stand, that has not been saying. So he's not saying something new. I think we should be asking him why is he just waking up saying it now? Is it because 2023 is around the corner? Is, they, we should start with, and you know, by the time they now start bringing God into this, at, at some point they, they just want to, you can't rubbish God, but they're just trying to, they're dragging God's um, integrity, integrity and um, sovereignty into public disrepute. You, you don't bring God into your judgmental hell. You shouldn't. God doesn't lie. Muhammad Bari wasn't the Messiah. This sentence the Bakari in the professor said the Messiah is coming from the northeast, even I think mentioned Adamawa at some point. So where did Adamawa turn to Dara? At what point? Please, you should save us this. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting that there's going to be more and more reactions to uh, this, of course, maybe from the presidency also. They haven't no, said, the presidency will know. be happy with this, you know. Mm. Um, it's their man, so they probably will be. And, you know, it was neither here nor there. It, it, Tinder Bakari in that, in that broadcast did not come at Muhammad Obar with his own judgment. It was like, about, uh, 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 no, if I had said this, Sultan of Sokota have said this, these people have said this, so, you know, so it's not saying I'm saying this, really, you know. So, so, it's, so for me, he it, it played safe, you, and he's their man, he's their, their friend. So they have a way to, they'll find a way around it. But for me, and him, it, he hasn't said anything new, and in fact, it came, quite late from him because was at some point if there was this was a Tunde Bakare that was at Ojota that with Nigerians demonstrating the removal of um, first subsidy. But so first subsidy has been removed like three, four times under this administration and nothing has happened. He hasn't led a protest. Yes, it's not it was, we can't force him to do that. But you should have your values and your value system should be constant. Shouldn't be changing as our post to change their clients. So that's it for me. Okay. He also, of course, uh, shared his views on the uh, three cardinal things that the government uh, campaigned with. He also spoke about security. Uh, do you agree with his, his views there? Well, uh, I don't know. It's obvious that to any, to every Nigerian, even if you wake up a 10-year-old kid, now tell that Nigeria is not safe. If you look at the fight against corruption and you look at the news you hear me and there, it was just... Um, Pure verbal city and um, good governance. Can you say Nigerians are enjoying good governance? No. So this government, our, I don't know. I've lost. I once I've lost hope of it in Nigeria. But in this government, no, they are not going to do anything new. 
let's just pray, wait, and wait to trench and to be able to see what he has to offer us. But the bribery will fight corruption. I don't see that happening. A Jonathan government that was accused, of, Jonathan's government that was accused of corruption, sacked Abdul Rashid Mena. And under the government of We Are Saints, led by Saint Mamadou Bari, <laughs> Abdul Rashid Mena was shipped into the country, was reinstated, and was even paid back all of his allowances. Till date, we've not had nobody's been held accountable for how Rashid Mena got into the country. Ababachi Alawa's case is just like, um, is grinding, uh, is moving at a snail speed. Um, in one of the site instances, the NHI's um, water secretary um, that, was, that became an embarrassment for the former Minister of Health, the man is now the one talking tough on behalf of the government now. Yeah, I don't think he has stepped the foot in court. Security, <laughs> like I said, I, I, you can't move anywhere in the country beyond 4 p.m. You, you probably need to be either holding your, your rosary, saying your hey maybe around 4 or 5 p.m. So, so you, don't, you don't agree with, because I'm, I'm really just sharing from his speech, yeah. the, his an analysis with regards to corruption, um, you know, according to him, says on anti-corruption, uh, President Mohamed Bari took commendable steps in the fight against corruption in the beginning of his administration, including attempts to plug the loopholes in the system through the Treasury single account. He also stated that the TSA received, or rather in 2016, Nigeria received its highest scorecard in Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index. Spoke about job creation also and the you know, moves by the government through the NPAR scheme. So don't you think that these things are commendable um, in any way? No, Tsundibaka is a very smart man. He could, yeah, why I say smart? He put, yeah, chipped in there the Transparency International rating of 2016. What happened to the TI's rating of 2018, 2019, 2020? And empower. You don't, you, don't, you, say you, don't, you don't fight unemployment by creating more jobs, opening up, opening up your civil service. You're going to, you're, we, are, we are complaining about how, how we're coming to spend nature gobs almost 70% of our budget, or budget spending and estimates. And here you're, still, you're, you're celebrating in power. United States of America, when they had this crazy um, economic um, downturn in the 60s and early 80s, what they did was, they, they came up with policies that uh, promote um, small business and give you small business back loans or whatever. In Nigeria, what did they give? Trade that money, 10,000, 15,000 naira, or 30,000 naira, which, which can be accounted for. Another thing they, they came up with, they're just the only country that you find it very difficult to do business. They forget about the, the campaign of ease of doing business. To open a bank account, a corporate bank account, you will sweat. They will ask you for things that you, that's quite primitive. So you can't walk into any bank and say with your business ideas, you back it. They won't give you the loan. If they want to give you the loan, it's going to be in double, with double digit um, interest rate. So what have they done? You don't fight unemployment by opening up the civil service because whether you like it or not, those guys will grow up in, in Keller and do hear more. And then you have to spend more on the current expenditure. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is unintelligent. And what have they done? You're trying to block the loopholes. You block the loopholes, but you opened other ones. What have they done to fight corruption? NNPC, what has happened to NNPC? As they, what, at the point, NNPC, even, NNPC was, um, came up with under recovery, whatever, whatever, spending away from, budget, from budgetary allocation from the National Assembly. In fact, we we're paying for subsidies. In fact, Mamadou Bari said subsidy, pay, payment of pay, for petrol subsidy is a fraud. But we we're told in 2016 that the removal of first subsidy will bring about um, stability in price and probably even a fall in price of PMS, pump price of PMS. And at, at, after the removal of PMS, of subsidy on PMS, we're still paying somewhere than 74 million naira daily. That was 2016, 2017. That an average of one million naira per local government. You do, that wasn't rocket science. It was just that it was just an allocation. And that has been. And every point they are still removing the subsidy that's not even in the budget. A lot of criminal things have gone under this administration. A corrupt practices, and you're saying they are fighting corruption. Oh. We, we, budget, we, we took money from the covers of the country to purchase to Kano jets, a outside budgetary allocation. And you're saying you're fighting corruption? And you said it's a doctrine of necessity, and three years after, we're still waiting for the Tucano jets? That we could have gotten from Membraya at the rate of $13 million maximum. We are paying $23 million for it. 
Well, um, hopefully, um, you know, there would be reactions to this. So hopefully, the government might also um, of course, uh, commend uh, Tun Bakari for his um, you know, statesmanship and, of course, his um, role that he has continued to play in nation building. Uh, Dear Misaka, thank you also for your role in nation building <laughs> and for joining us uh, this morning. No, thank I, you. I should be thank you too for giving the platform to, <laughs> to, to allow me to continue my quotes as a nation builder. But really, we, as a nation, we need to start telling ourselves the truth. We should stop patronizing those in power if we want this country to move forward. You know, we have a president that is in the UK now, the resident doctors are on strike. You have an Ingigil as minister. If a medical doctor justifying Government's actions against doctors. It's, 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 it's sad. Indeed, oh. indeed. Thank you very Thanks much very again. Much. You're welcome. All right. Yes, let's take a break here and uh, we'll be speaking on this very important issue of rising insecurity in the Southwest. The prison breaks we saw, over a thousand people escaped, and accusations that the IPOB may or may not have been involved. And uh, we'll be speaking to the media advisor, to the former president general of Ohanese Ndibo. Stay with us.